example is we built the wrong one. We built the SR-71, which undoubtedly is the finest airplane that has ever been built. But in terms of what the need for this country was at that particular time, I think Kelly will agree with this, we built the wrong airplane. Today, we don't have an interceptor that can really bear the name of interceptor. And here's an airplane that 14 years ago was exceeding all the world speed and altitude records. Even today, in the form of the, of the SR-71, is a considerably greater airplane than anything we have. But we needed an interceptor, and we didn't get it. Kelly Johnson had to accept with some bitterness that this masterpiece would not be produced in significant numbers. Only a few would ever be built, and they would be shrouded in the most effective security possible. Limiting manufacture to the SR-71 reconnaissance version ensured the mystery of the Blackbird, whereas the more public role of a fighter version might have allowed the crescendo of worldwide acclaim that the achievement warranted. The SR-71 was announced by President Johnson on July 24, 1964. It came as somewhat of a surprise to Lockheed because the SR-71 was supposed to be the RS-71 or the R-71. The R stood for reconnaissance and the S ambiguously for strike. However, it was decided that the president's name would stick as standing for strategic reconnaissance. The SR-71 took off for its first flight on December 22, 1964. The flight was a complete success. Everything worked, and the pilots and mechanics were happy with the aircraft. The flight testing program proceeded well, most major problems having already been sorted out during the experience of the A-12 and YF-12 projects. The SR-71 progressed to acceptance tests at Edwards Air Force Base on August 13, 1965, and proceeded smoothly through testing and into service. Enough information about the Blackbirds continued to seep out to ensure that they became one of the most famous secrets in the world. Aircraft enthusiasts came to know enough about the plane and its capabilities to develop an appreciation of the achievement it represented. Then, in September 1974, the Farnborough Air Show received a very special visitor. The SR-71 had flown from New York to London in 1 hour, 54 minutes, 56.4 seconds. Needless to say, this was a record. Aviation enthusiasts turned into fans, and film processors made a small fortune. Whenever the SR-71 turned up at an air show, it attracted a large crowd on its own. In fact, even the unfounded rumor that one would show up led to good crowds. The SR-71 spent so little time in public that this was understandable. On its way back to the U.S. after the 1974 Farnborough Show, the SR-71 set another record, London to Los Angeles in 3 hours and 48 minutes. This included rendezvous for refueling in flight. In terms of local times, it arrived about 4 hours before it took off. Among other records claimed by the Blackbird was the flight on the 26th of April, 1971, which covered 15,000 miles in 10 and a half hours non-stop. This was the equivalent of San Francisco to Paris and back.
The U.S. Air Force flew its SR-71s with the 9th Strategic Reconnaissance Wing, based at Beale Air Force Base in Northern California. They received their first Blackbirds in January 1966. In the next 24 years, they flew thousands of long-distance missions. Regular deployments were made to bases around the world. Flights covered most of the world's surface. Only top-of-the-line pilots were eligible to fly the SR-71. Requirements were about the same as for the astronaut program. There were no shortages of applicants for the job, however. fancy escape capsules built into the aircraft. Kelly Johnson figured that the spacesuit the pilot wore was already an adequately controlled environment, and he concentrated on how to get the pilot clear of the plane at Mach 3. The ejection seat and parachutes inevitably had to be specially developed. Of course, there is no real way to test such an escape system. Obviously, you cannot simply take a Blackbird up to Mach 3 at 80,000 feet and shoot the crew out. At some point in the process, you have to accept whatever can be proved in adequate tests and deduce the rest. heights and speeds, what was achievable could at best be only partially guaranteed. Over the years, at least 11 SR-71s were lost for various reasons, and several crewmen died. troublesome to maintain and became progressively more expensive to keep flying. Each airframe had its own personality, a fact that pilots became very aware of. This may in part be due to the nature of the metal. Kelly Johnson asserted that each flight above Mach 3 would effectively retemper the alloy, theoretically giving the planes the strength to go on forever. However, coupled with what was essentially hand construction, this also gave each plane its own characteristics. Pilot instruction called for a special training variant. The SR-71 was a plane unlike any other, and simulators and other training aids were little preparation for the real thing. The trainer sat in a second cockpit, stepped above the normal clean lines of the airframe. It was cramped and afforded little view, but there was only so much that could be done to the shape.